Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 473. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because all of us have to start somewhere. You have already started because you're listening here. But here's the thing. There's lots of things that you might need to know, things that you might want to learn. And at the end of the day, there are people that you and I both know who have not yet started because they're concerned about what they don't know, what could trip them up, and more importantly, how on earth is am I going to start anything, and when, when might I be able to actually make a profit? Yeah, I know, that's the questions you're asking, but more importantly than any of that, when we don't know something, we tend to look for that knowledge. We want a place to go and grab it. Well, today, what if there was a school for startups hmm. that would be interesting in fact i've got a gentleman with me today who literally wrote the book of school for startups the breakthrough course for generating and guaranteeing small business success in 90 days or less now that's a strong title we're going to hold him to that as we question but most importantly his new book free radio and podcast marketing in 30 minutes could you imagine being able to fire your publicist and leverage free radio and podcasting to market your business brand or idea? Some of us are concerned about how we're going to get the word out. Well, we're going to get the word out by getting the word out with you today because we're going to be talking to none other than Jim Beach. He's been a speaker, obviously author. He runs schools for startup.com. And what's really interesting is that there can be a, a science if you will, to this entrepreneurship thing. And if you learn, if you listen, if you really, really want to, you can do it. So let's get ready to take some notes. Let's get ready to give our full attention. And let's get ready to learn from Jim Beach. Jim, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Jay. Uh, good. I'm glad that you're here. So this being the first time that you're here, uh, I tend to ask everybody the same question the first time that they're here because I uh, uh, I think it makes it, it sets the ground rules. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, like Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. And uh, because as an entrepreneur occasionally i can envision myself running around town possibly wearing a cape and tights uh using our products and services to rescue our customers but just like a superhero an entrepreneur has a beginning for example think about spider-man there was a time where he was just a kid going to school doing his thing possibly taking some photos right and and trying to earn some pizza money and then one day something special happens to him and he realizes i have this new ability and he gets to use it for good or evil. So my question to you is as follows. So before the websites, before the books, before the interviews, before everything that people know you for today, what we want to know is, who is Jim Beach? Well, I, I have no idea how to answer that question. I was the guy that got fired all of the time. <laughs> I have a, a great history of being asked to leave really respectful businesses. So my career started, I was a Coca-Cola employee, and I really thought that I was going to end up as the CEO of Coca-Cola one day. I was 
I thought making all the right moves, saving the company tons and tons of money. I literally, Jay, saved the company a billion dollars. And they still decided that I should leave the premises. And so I was invited to go away. And I asked the person who was firing me, you know, why? What did I do wrong? And he said, oh, you didn't do anything wrong. We just don't think you fit in with our culture. We think you would be better as an entrepreneur. And I had never once considered entrepreneurship as any part of my life. I, I had no desire to be an entrepreneur. It was completely off the screen for me. And so I decided to go back to school. I was going to become a student again and go get another master's degree. And very politely, my parents said that was a great idea, but they had no intention of helping pay for it. So if I wanted to go back to school, I should get a job and pay for my own school. So I decided instead of getting a job, I would just start a little business. And I made a list of all of the businesses that were summertime businesses so that I could go to school nine months a year and work three months a year. That was my goal. And so I wrote, made a list, you know, landscaping, pool maintenance, uh, summer camps, you know, all of these businesses that only exist during the summer. And I got to admit, I don't like being outside and sweating and getting hot. I love it in the winter, but not during the summer. I don't like to sweat. So I didn't think that landscaping was my calling. So I decided to start a summer camp and that that would hopefully allow me to go and pay for my tuition and make enough money to survive during the nine months mm -hmm. when we didn't have camp. Well, within three years, my summer camp had grown to a year-round business with 700 employees in 89 locations around the world, and I had to drop out of school because my business was going too well. <laughs> so that's my start as an entrepreneur. That was the first thing I did. It was completely by accident. It was not something that I wanted or planned on. It just sort of happened organically. Um... Uh, the first year, we made 56000 in revenue and had 56000 in expenses. So I broke mm. even and did not make enough money to support myself. But I was able to some, do some other things to get by. And eventually, the business surpassed any of my expectations and was so big that I had to drop out. So this begs some, uh, a number of questions. First... <laughs> you got fired and they told you to go be an entrepreneur. I've never heard anyone say that before. That's amazing. How do you feel about that advice today? Well, you know, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. So uh, I'm very appreciative. I was working there under a man named Doug Daft and another guy named Doug Ivester. Both of them ended up becoming... CEOs of Coca-Cola and both of them ended up getting fired as CEO of Coca-Cola. So it is a situation where if I had joined their group, had been part of their team, that, that I would have been fired too. And so I probably would have been 28 years old with a house, a mortgage, two kids and unemployed. So leaving Coca-Cola was the best thing that ever happened to me. Well, and what's interesting is that I think a lot of stories start that way, where it didn't probably feel that great at the time, and it becomes this blessing, so to speak, in disguise. But I think the the fact that they were willing to tell you we you that we think you'd be a better entrepreneur it is that that had to be a mindset shift for you because you said you you hadn't considered it, so why not? You know, I, I'm from Atlanta. Uh, one of our best family friends is the guy who invented Diet Coke. We used to go to his house and he would make Diet Coke from scratch, you know, <laughs> using the real ingredients. He was the guy who knew the formula. And I just thought of myself as a corporate person that, you know, that's uh, what I wanted. I wanted to work at a big company. 
Uh, I wanted the security of that. I wanted to work overseas for them. I worked for Coca-Cola in Japan for a time, and I really enjoyed that. And so to me, the idea of starting a business just hadn't come on the radar. You know, we're, in the, we're talking the late 80s now, and we certainly had entrepreneurs back then, but they weren't the rock stars that they are today. <laughs> you know, so it, it just wasn't sexy at the time. In the late 80s, you were supposed to get a job on Wall Street or for a big Fortune 500 company. That's what I was raised to do. You know, I went off and got an MBA so I could get a job at a Fortune 500 company, not so that I could be an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, totally understood. And, and I find it interesting that you said you were going to go back to school to get a second master's degree. Out of curiosity, what 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 in what was that degree going to be in? Well, I, I do have two already. I have an MBA and then a master's of Japanese linguistics. I was going back to get a master's of architecture and become an architect. But that never happened. I'm sort of like George Costanza from Seinfeld. <laughs> I, I secretly wish I was an architect and pretend to be on dates. Got it. Totally understood. Now, what was it about the the summer camp business that said, yeah, this is the one? Like, you, you, you wrote your list, but what stuck out to you that made you go, okay, this is the one that I could do? Because there's nothing in your background that you've shared this far that would make it sound like, summer camp was going to be the the natural progression there was no uh logic behind this it was the only thing left on the list so <laughs> yes. i had crossed I off that. everything else there was nothing left on the list then by process of elimination we go to okay summer camp all right i'm down exactly. for that yeah I'm... so you know when i knew i could do it i i went to summer camp as a kid uh -huh. right so i certainly had experience and i had been a summer camp consumer many times so i, I didn't think that it would be that hard and in fact I, I don't think it's a hard business i think it's a very simple business to run it's a great place for an entrepreneur today to start uh we just decided to do it at, at a bigger level than it had ever been done before. So we were the first company to have 90 locations running simultaneously in different countries around the world. You know, We did take it to a whole new level. Um, one of the things I haven't told you about yet is the location for the summer camps mm -hmm. was part of our secret sauce. We were located at places like Stanford, MIT, Georgetown, UCLA, SMU, University of Michigan, Cambridge, Sorbonne, Oxford, you know, brand name schools like that that everyone knew about. So it was a very sexy business. Uh, I had no idea going into it that that's what it would be. We just started calling around looking for locations and Stanford was on the list and we called Stanford really out of the blue and Stanford said, yeah, sure. We'd love to have you uh, on campus. What days do you want? What weeks do you want? And within like 30 seconds, we were signed up at Stanford and that, <laughs> that changed our perception of who we were. If we could get Stanford, well then my goodness, we could get MIT too. And so our first year we opened with two camps, one at Stanford and one at MIT and that sort of set the standard for everything that we did after that. You know, a lot of our competitors, uh, you know, they had one or two locations and they were at places that you had never heard of. And so the question became very simple. Would you rather send your kid to some place you've never heard of or MIT? You know, and so <laughs> that doesn't sound like much of a uh, of a of a thought process there. So, no, you know. So it wasn't. Got it. So talk to talk to uh, us about the numbers for a second, because you said the first year uh, you broke even. A yep. lot of people might have thrown in the towel. What was it that made you go, all right, we'll try it again? Well, so we had 96 campers the first year, spread out over four weeks. So that's uh, 24 campers a week on average. By the end of the summer, we probably already had that many people signed up for the next summer. So our growth, it was obvious that uh, the perfect growth pattern was going to happen, 
that we doubled in size while having our marketing cost. So we could literally double. As a matter of fact, we did more than double. We went from 24 students a week to 100 students a week for the entire summer. So we went from two weeks to eight weeks. So from 48 campers at Stanford, we went to 800 in the next year. And we were able to decrease our marketing budget while still growing four or five hundred percent at a time. And we already saw that. We already saw the enthusiasm. We already saw the way that the parents were accepting us. We started getting telephone calls on Tuesday. Hey, my neighbor's kid is in a program of yours. Can I sign up right now? No, I'm sorry. We're already full, but we can sign you up for next year. And we had people signing up for 11 months in the future. And so it was obvious that the that it was going to work. And then people started calling us, like Amherst University called us out of the blue after we begged Stanford and we begged MIT. Within six months, Amherst was calling us and saying, hey, we'd like you to come and run a summer camp here. Would you be interested? And so we went from begging for both campuses, locations, and students to having uh, the best of both. When brand name universities would call us and we had hundreds of kids signed up already. So uh, it became quickly apparent that we had stumbled onto a working formula. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Now, talk to us uh, about that formula. There's a number of individuals who are listening who obviously would love to figure out a formula, any formula, if you will, uh, for, for their business brand or idea. Uh, and then you, you also said something that is very key is you were able to grow revenue while decreasing expenses. And I'm going to take a stab and say that that's part of the idea behind your book as well. Yeah, that, that is, that's certainly a, a huge proponent of my, of the formula that I use today. And it's certainly something that, you know, I, I still believe in that you can be cash flow positive year run in a business and that that is a, a very conceivable way to, to operate for almost any business. And we can walk through some of the other businesses I've done, some of the businesses I've consulted with. You know, in industries where people say you cannot make money in the beginning or you need a million dollars to get started, mm -hmm. I have had clients or friends that started for $5,000. And, you know, in a business that would require a million dollars to get started, according to the conventional wisdom. But to answer your first question, Jay, the the secret formula was was two things uh, or maybe maybe more than that. But two and really in particular that the parents loved. Number one was we were at brand name, great schools, really close to their house. So in San Francisco, for example, we ended up with four locations in San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley area, uh, simply because we wanted to stay close so that you could, you know, come and drop your kid off within 20 minutes or so. So we had multiple locations. Once we were strong in a market, we opened uh, auxiliary locations pretty quickly. Another part of our formula was, you know, I don't know if you have kids, Jay, I'm looking at your picture right now. You look like you're a young man. You're not old like I am now. Um, but I, I know that I have kids now, and my number one thing about kids is I want to get rid of them as much as possible. <laughs> now, I really love my kids, but I love them more when you're taking care of them. And we saw that early on at our camp. And so our camp did the unthinkable. We went from 7 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Wow. And so that was for a seven-year-old. Well, a seven-year-old had never been out of the house that long. But think about what mom and dad are thinking. Mom and dad are thinking, so I can send my kid to a normal camp that's from nine until two. Well, who's going to take off work at 1.30 and go get the kid? You know, I, someone's got to be at home at 1.30, two o'clock when camp fin finishes to get the kid and take care of the kid. But that, that doesn't give mom and dad the week off that they were hoping for. What if the, not the overnight student, but the commuter kid 
could get dropped off as you go to work at 730. They could feed him breakfast so you don't even have to worry about that. They feed him dinner and mom and dad come home from work. They have a nice dinner. They go to a movie. They go out on a date and they pick the kid up on the way home from their date. Uh, the kid's exhausted and falls asleep in the car. Dad is a happy man, I promise you. I promise you that dad is a happy man having that little boy or girl asleep already. You know, they carry the kid up to bed. He falls asleep. And maybe mommy and dad have a few minutes of uh, alone time. Um, yeah, the- yeah. Now, it, it sounds so it sounds like you leverage the the already existing, we'll call it brand and marketing uh, of reliable institutions. And then you just really address the need of your consumer. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. And I'm glad that you are enjoying what you are hearing thus far. But here's one of the things that's really important. One of the most important things that you can do as get started. One of the things that I've said before, and I say again, once you get started, stay started. But more importantly, there can be lots of roadblocks to getting started. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove one of those roadblocks for you and make it a little bit easier. Because the thing that I don't want to stop you is thinking, do I need a local number? How about a long distance number? Or should it be 800? How on earth am I going to make that happen so that people can contact me as I'm out there building my business, making my cash flow grow, but most importantly, understanding that it doesn't have to be difficult. Many of you may know, but if you don't, There's a company out there by the name of Grasshopper. And what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Grasshopper is the entrepreneur's phone system. It works like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware to purchase, no software to install. It's just a number that flat works. So if you are out there building that distributed workforce across many different locations, it's a way for you to still go out there and make your number be unified, simple, easy to use, something we've been using for quite some time. So again, go over to trygrasshopper.com forward slash cash flow diary. Now let's get back to the rest of the story. Yeah. You know, uh, the idea that they didn't have to do anything and their kid could be 100% outsourced. Uh, parents loved that. And then on top of that, we did provide a great product. So the kids did learn. We were academic camps, not sports camps, but the kids did learn and we had a great time. Hold, you know, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. You got them to learn from seven to 10? Yeah. Yeah, we did. We had a really great carrot and a stick. You know, the, the idea of you can have free game time on computers and you can play a game versus a bunch of kids at MIT and there's going to be five of you versus five kids at MIT uh, and all of you are going to be playing this really cool computer game against each other or having a movie making contest or, or whatever our event was but you don't get to do that until you finish this assignment um, that works you know so we were able to get the kids on a you know, eight hour a day learning regimen, but then we also mixed in a lot of fun and we would do things that today you'd probably get arrested for. One of our favorite things to do was to take, take a kid and tape him to the wall (laughs) so that he was dangling from the wall with duct tape. And I'd probably get arrested for that today, but back in the eighties, that was funny. It still is funny, but yeah, you probably would get arrested. Uh, So talk to us then Let's pretend that, uh, you know, someone listening, they've got a brand new business because that that's where you guys started. It was brand new. No one. And yet, how, how do they leverage already existing, you know, entities to be able to to get their word out and, and, and address their customers needs? Well, you know, I've always done that. Every business that I've run, not all, but just about all of them have been involved with someone else's brand name. When I can wrap myself in MIT or Stanford or Intel and Microsoft, uh, we were sponsored by Intel and Microsoft, Uh, I've gone a long way uh, towards establishing trust with you. And so if I answer the telephone, computer camp at Stanford and MIT, sponsored by Intel and Microsoft, how can I help you? 
you're going to be blown away already by, uh, you know, some sort of uh, awareness that this is a well-run organization. The fact that I was 24 years old didn't bother you because I had been given Stanford and MIT's blessing. And I've been able to do that many different times. Uh, you know, my first book, School for Startups, was published by McGraw-Hill, which is one mm -hmm. of the top three or four publishers in the world, one of the most prestigious publishing houses out there. And so, you know, uh, you would think that book would sell better because it was associated with one of the top publishing houses. Um, I've imported and exported all sorts of things, and I always try to import the best brand names that I can. So if I'm importing oranges from Spain, I'm going to try to import Valencia oranges because that's the only brand name of orange that anyone can name or think of. <laughs> right. you know, have you heard of Valencia oranges before? Yeah, as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, he's going to go, he, he's going to say Valencia. That exactly. Is. You know, so, uh, you know, that sort of sets you apart from all of the other people. Um, I had a dental business. It was sponsored by the American Dental Association, you know, right. so. Uh, that's a great way to, at the very beginning, differentiate your brand new business from everyone else. So I would work very hard to get sponsorships, and it's not as hard as you think. Uh, I've been sponsored by every cool organization out there for some reason or another, NASA, you know, uh, all sorts of cool people, because I come up with some sort of value proposition that is interesting enough to them that they go, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sponsor with you because I can come up with something that's exciting enough to them. They say, yeah, that, that's a good benefit for us. Uh, I would like to be associated with your business. So that's the number one way to differentiate your new business is to try to find other people's brand names to associate with yourself. I used to have a furniture company, and I can tell you the whole story. It's a great entrepreneurial story. But our first customer was the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Group. Well, I told that to everyone, every other customer that ever bought anything from that right. business. The first thing I told them, I was like, well, this style right here, this is what the Ritz-Carlton has been buying a lot of. Right. <laughs> so right now, you know, and I'm not bragging about it. I'm just sort of casually name dropping, you know, and the reason they're buying it is because it fits in really well with the st uh, dry stack stone fireplace. Do you have a dry stack stone fire? You do. Well, then this is the line that I would recommend for you. Right. You know? Because the Ritz Carlton blessed it. Yeah, and no, totally get it. Totally get it. But I'm obsessed with using other people's brand names. Now, when it comes to the, the entrepreneurs who are out there, how, how can they employ the strategy for, for their business? Go and ask 10 businesses to sponsor you. you know, uh, Come up with a valuable reason, some reason why they would want to get some benefit from you. Put together a five-page proposal and start sending it to people. You, know, you can't get rejected unless you've actually asked. You can't get accepted <laughs> right. until you've asked, you know, so you make a list of industry partners. So who would want to sponsor a bunch of really smart academic kids who are studying at MIT? Well, it turns out a lot of companies would want to be associated with that, you know, and so uh, who wants to be affiliated with a furniture company? Well, it turns out there are a lot of furniture companies or accessory companies or companies that do furniture cleaning or something like that that want to be associated with high-end furniture that happens to be at every Ritz-Carlton in the United States. So uh, coming up with a pitch is not that hard. As a matter of fact, if your listeners email me, I will send you my standard sponsor kit. So I have a standard thing that I send everybody now, and I'll gladly share it with anyone who emails me. I I think that's that's a great idea. Now, with with that being said, um, when it comes to actually using, you know, media today, is there a particular strategy, or is there a particular 
uh, medium, if you will, that that you prefer over others? No, not really. I, I I've utilized all of them. So I have literally Jay had billboards. I have had TV ads. I have had radio ads. I have done live Twitter shows where you tweet back and forth with the host and everyone reads the the contents of the show. I've been on hundreds of radio shows. Uh, I, I've done anything, any media that I can do, I have uh, wholeheartedly embraced. My favorite has to be, I have to tell you, is being on radio as a guest, just like right now. Uh, you know, this is a great way for me to spread my message. There are thousands of radio shows that are consistently needing guests. And so I try to do as much radio as I can to promote my products. And usually that's free. As a matter of fact, it's always free. There are some radio shows that charge you, but I don't go on those radio shows. I only go on the ones that are free. And by the way, I consider radio and podcast the same thing. I group that into one big category. They act and serve you in the exact same manner. It doesn't matter how people are listening via their iPad or their car radio. It doesn't matter. It's still the same medium. Yeah, totally understood. Totally understood. Now, uh, for those entrepreneurs that are listening right now that, that are experiencing possibly a mindset shift in how they can get their word out and begin to make uh, their own business brand or idea happen a little bit more um what's going to be the best way for them to to follow up with you and and, and find out more well go to my website there's a contact form there it's jimbeach.com or you can just email me at james.beach at att.net that's a great way too i answer my own emails and if you ask for help i will gladly give you uh all my my advice uh, another giveaway that I will give out to people, if they email asking for my list of radio shows, I will send that as well. So this is a list of about 2,000 radio shows that are all radio shows slash podcast that are always looking for guests and the email address of the person in charge of booking guests. And so it's a very simple process. Write a one page uh, proposal about why you would be an interesting, sexy guest. Send it to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and you will end up on tens of radio shows. So you're not going to get on 100%. You're not going to get on 50%. But it's very conceivable that you would get on 30% or 20% of the radio shows, podcast that you ask. The same thing with guest blogging. I probably guest blog... Uh, I don't know, once a month or so. And I have a very high success rate of asking blogs, hey, would you like a guest blog? Uh, most people say yes to that. And that's a great way to get your name and message out as well. And again, it costs absolutely nothing. Got it. Now, for the entrepreneurs that are listening, uh, as we, we went down here, I, I've got a question for you. Let's pretend that, you know, they're sitting on what I like to call the precipice of decision. They've listened to you this far and they're like, okay, cool. I, I, I get it. I, I'm, I'm going to move forward with, with things like this. This makes sense to me. I can, I can make that happen. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I know that in moments of decision, what often happens is that we have this companion and that companion comes in the form of a voice. And, and it says things to us like, are you, are you sure, like, are you really going to do something this time? Like, you're really going to be able to to get your idea out there? That's actually going to happen for you? You, you? you think that's for real? Or for some people, they're even related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. Let's pretend that this time they're actually going to follow through, and they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? Well, first of all, I have that little voice, too, and I listen to it all of the time. I'm able to shut it up by saying one thing. I'm not going to waste a bunch of money. So I am going to experiment with this business idea for under $5,000, and I'm not going to spend mm. a penny more. 
And little voice, if I agree with you, and my voice, my little voice has been replaced now, Jay, with my wife. <laughs> wife, if I promise to only spend five thousand dollars, can I try this? And if that's the situation, you've done so much to reduce your risk that it's an easier decision to make to get started. I'm only risking $5,000. I can afford that. That's one week of vacation. That's one week at Disney. I, I'm willing to take that risk. But then also, it makes it so much easier to succeed because the bar of success is so much lower. I don't need to make $100,000 to be paying off my startup capital. All I have to do is make $5,000. And by the way, to make $5,000, all I have to do is sell three of these chairs to the Ritz-Carlton. If I sell three chairs, I will be cash flow positive. Okay, can I sell three chairs? Yeah, I think I can. You know, not even to the Ritz-Carlton, just to normal old consumers who might like my chairs. And so that changes the whole game if you reduce your startup capital. Now, people will come and say, well, you can't start the business. I want to start with $5,000. I hear that every day. And I say, well, first of all, I disagree with you because I probably know somebody who did start your business for under $5,000. So I probably disagree with you. And secondly, it seems like you're already quitting. You know, my attitude is I've got $5,000. I'm going to go see. Your attitude is, I plan on spending a hundred thousand, but I'm going to wait around until I've got two hundred thousand, and that never happens, right? So with five thousand dollars, you're more act more likely to actually try because the bar is lower. It's just not as risky. You're willing to take the small risk, not the big risk. And then you wow, lo and behold, I can make five thousand dollars in a month at this business. And now all of a sudden you're profitable, cash flow positive. And your wife's attitude about the business has changed. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Totally, totally uh, have experienced that very, very thing. So um, I, I just want to be one of the first to say I, I appreciate uh, your vast amount of experience in so many different areas, but also sticking true to the roots of bootstrapping, making it work, figuring out a way and systems and processes uh, to, to be able to duplicate your success and, and sharing that information. And most importantly, thanks for being here uh, to share your knowledge, your wisdom, as well as your insight with us today at the Cashflow Diary, sir. My pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means email him. He gave you his email. That doesn't happen that often, but do it. Why? Because you know you heard something that resonated. More importantly, it's time for you to go out there and make your thing happen. At the end of the day, it's your time right now. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. 